All right, so if you've been following the adversarial example literature, and if the program today is any indication, a lot of you have, you've probably noticed that there have been quite a lot of papers uh, quite a lot of them claim to have defenses against adversarial examples. Quite a lot of those papers get broken very quickly. And in general, it's just become a very chaotic and confusing topic to follow. So rather than coming and presenting primarily some new conference paper submission, I thought the most useful thing I could do for you is to try to give some kind of clarity and an overview of the topic, at least summarizing the important aspects of it from the way that I see it. Um, if we think of adversarial examples in contrast to other kinds of machine learning research, the most important thing to understand is that until recently, most machine learning algorithms were based on the IID assumptions. Uh, the first I stands for independent. It means that each of the examples are generated independently from each other. The second I stands for identical. It means that the train and the test distribution are identical. And the distribution used to generate each individual example within those distributions is identical. You can see these scatter plots here where on the left I show you several training examples from two different classes and on the right I show you several test examples from the same class. Because they're both drawn independently from the same distribution, the data that you see at test time is very similar to the data that you see at training time. And there are, are ways to generalize both in theory and in practice from the train distribution to the test set. Recently, machine learning more or less solved this task uh, in several different application areas, reaching human-level performance on IID test data in about 2013. Uh, we found that we were able to recognize objects and photos and score as well as a human, recognize faces on certain benchmarks and score as well as a human on those benchmarks. We were also able to read obfuscated text uh, better than a human and remove the usefulness of text-based CAPTCHAs. Uh, and we were able to learn to transcribe text from photos in non-adversarial settings very effectively. What's important to understand about a lot of these benchmarks claiming human-level performance is that there are some major caveats to them. Uh, one aspect of these human-level benchmarks is that we're benchmarking the human on tasks that humans are not very good at. For example, when we look at object recognition, we ask humans to tell apart very different classes that are obscure and not what most humans have experience recognizing. Uh, this animal on the left here is called, I believe, a, a thole. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. It's an ImageNet category. And so if you benchmarked me on ImageNet, I would probably not do very well at recognizing this animal whose name I'm not sure I know how to pronounce. Um, there's also very similar ImageNet categories, like Alaskan Huskies and Siberian Huskies. I, I can say those words, but I can't really tell you the difference between those breeds. They're, they're both just dogs that look like wolves to me. So first, we've benchmarked these machine learning systems in a setting where the human doesn't perform very well. The other thing is we have benchmarked the machine learning systems in the IID setting. If we actually move to unusual data that's different from what the machine learning saw at training time, the machine learning algorithm will make a lot of mistakes. So here I have a picture of an apple in a mesh bag, and a machine learning model that I tested it on no longer recognizes it as an apple once I've put it in this context. Um, it shows how even a small amount of domain shift can be enough to break some of these models. For the purposes of security, we need to solve this problem of moving beyond IID data, because attackers can intentionally present inputs that are not drawn independently from each other and are not uh, drawn from identical distributions to what the model was trained on. Uh, this example of the stop sign that's been modified to have graffiti on it, it looks like it says love stops hate, would not actually fool a human into ignoring the stop sign, but it does fool several machine learning models. Moreover, the test data is not necessarily drawn independently, uh, one example from another. Once the attacker finds a mistake, they can repeat it over and over again. So these both make security a lot more difficult than traditional machine learning. As we've started to study the performance of machine learning models in the non-IID setting, we found that they make very surprising mistakes. The first time that we really noticed this in the deep learning community was when Christian Zegedy started trying to study how convolutional networks make their classification decisions. He wasn't actually trying to break the, the convolutional network. He was trying to analyze it. 
He thought he would start with a clean image and modify it by following the gradient of the probability of another class until the class changed. And he was expecting that if you tried to turn a school bus into an ostrich, maybe the school bus would grow feathers and then you would know that it, the network recognizes ostriches based on their texture. Or maybe the shape of the school bus would change to be ostrich-like, but it would remain yellow. And then you'd know that the convolutional net recognizes ostriches by their shape. Instead, not much of anything happens. Uh, and the first time that I coded this up myself, my instinct is to think it's a bug at first. You run the program, it tells you that the output changed. It doesn't look like the input changed. My first instinct is to think, oh, I have some display bug. I'm showing the same input twice. You can throw it into IPython and check the difference between the images. There really is a difference, it's just very small. So as we've started to look at the non-IID setting, we've found these very surprising mistakes where very small changes can completely change the output class. In general, there are a lot of different ways that you can imagine an attacker attacking a machine learning algorithm. We have a pipeline where training data is consumed and turned into learned parameters, and then learned parameters are used to classify test inputs and produce test outputs. Attackers can do many different things, like introduce uh, training set examples that cause the model to learn wrong things. That's called training set poisoning. Uh, they can analyze learned parameters in order to steal the model, possibly to gain private information about the training set, or possibly just to steal the IP encoded in the model. Um, even observing the outputs of the model is sufficient to do those model theft attacks. Today what we'll focus on is adversarial examples where the attacker supplies malicious inputs at test time. They don't get to alter the parameters of the model, they just get to present inputs that cause the model to make mistakes. The idea of what constitutes an adversarial example has evolved over time. When we first started using the phrase adversarial example, uh, I coined that phrase to go in Christian's paper. He had been calling the inputs he made like the school bus ostrich hard examples and I was concerned that people would think that he was referring to hard negative mining. So we coined the phrase adversarial examples to describe specifically those kinds of inputs that he was using. Over time, we found it useful to have a phrase that refers to any kind of input created by an adversary. So these examples are defined uh, by the intent behind them rather than by their actual geometric location in space. Even this picture of the apple in the bag, because I created this photo with the intention of fooling the classifier, uh, counts as an example, uh, an instance of an adversarial example. From this point of view, we see that defending against adversarial examples is actually a very difficult challenge. The way that we should study this problem is to define a game. And a lot of recent papers, I think, are not very clear about exactly what game they are studying. That's something that should definitely be improved in the literature. To really define a game, we should say what the action space is for the defender, and we should say what the action space is for the attacker, we should also define a cost function for the defender. And finally, we should define a cost function for the attacker. These games are not necessarily minimax. We should actually specify a different cost for the defender and the attacker. A lot of the time, the cost function for the defender is the number of mistakes that they make. But the cost function for the attacker might not be just the negation of that. For example, the attacker might want to cause the model to make specific mistakes. You might want to... Um, get into a secure facility by having your face misrecognized. And in that case, it's not enough to have the model not realize that I'm Ian Goodfellow. I need to have the model think that I am specifically one of the people who has access to the facility. So I'm not just trying to cause errors, I'm trying to cause specific targeted errors. Once you've defined this kind of a game, you need to think about what level of access the attacker has. This is another thing that is not necessarily always spelled out very clearly in the current literature. Loosely speaking, there are white box attacks where the attacker has full knowledge of what goes on in the model, and there are black box attacks where the attacker has restricted amounts of knowledge about what happens in the model. But as we start to examine specific attack scenarios, we see that it's not enough to just say whether the attack is white box or black box. There are many different kinds of partial access that the attacker can have. I've liked to joke that this is the 50 shades of gray box attacks against machine learning algorithms. So some variants include the variant where the attacker gets to send inputs to the machine learning model and observe the outputs, but doesn't know the parameters of the model. In other variants, the attacker might know the architecture of the neural network, but doesn't know its parameters. In other variants, the attacker may not know whether it's a neural network being used at all. They might not know whether it's a support vector machine or a decision tree. Uh, all of these different models should be specified clearly when describing the claim that motivates a defense. <coughs> 
For the purposes of security, one of the most concerning properties of adversarial examples is that they tend to transfer between different models. Here I show you the weights of two different logistic regression classifiers trained on two different subsets of the MNIST training set. On the left, you can see one set of data. On the right, you can see another set of data. I'm training these models to recognize the difference between threes and sevens. A logistic regression model just applies one coefficient to each input feature. So you can summarize the entire model by visualizing the coefficients that it puts on each of the input pixels. I show the weight vectors with all these coefficients in the images in the bottom row of the slide. Wherever you see white pixels, those are pixels that vote for uh, the input being a seven. Wherever you see black pixels, that's where you see pixels that vote for the input being a three. You can see that the two different logistic regression models trained on these two different sets of data have learned more or less the same weight vectors. They both look a little bit like an image of a seven with an image of a three subtracted off of it. Because these two different algorithms learn more or less the same weights, they're vulnerable to the same attacks. It means that an attacker can fool a model that they don't have access to by exploiting this transfer property. Uh, Nicola here in the audience has shown that this, tech, this transfer technique works across completely different machine learning algorithms, whether they're logistic regression models, support vector machines, dishes and trees, k nearest neighbors, or deep neural nets. So this means that we can construct an attack using the transfer property. We target a model that has unknown weights or an unknown architecture, and we train our own model to mimic the target model. And then we make adversarial examples for our substitute model, and finally, we deploy those adversarial examples against the target model. Because of the transfer property, it's very likely that we'll fool both. There are also some ways that you can improve the likelihood of this transfer attack succeeding. Uh, one is that you can train your substitute model to explicitly reverse engineer the target model by sending inputs to the target and observing the outputs and adding them to the training data for the substitute model. Another approach is to attack an ensemble of models if you have very many different models and you find an adversarial example that fools all of them, it's extremely likely that you will fool an additional unknown target model. In this experiment from this paper here, researchers found that if they successfully fooled five different convolutional nets, they essentially had a 100% success rate at fooling a sixth convolutional net. And they alternated the set of which five they trained on and which, which of the sixth they tested on. Most of the games that we study in adversarial example literature today are based on norm balls. And I think this has caused a lot of confusion. One thing I want to make clear today is that the norm balls are really a toy task intended for basic research. They're not necessarily intended as a realistic model of a specific real world existing security situation. Uh, there's a few different paths to studying norm balls. I wrote one of the papers that proposed one of the metrics that's popular. So I want to explain a little bit about what I was thinking about when I proposed this particular metric. Um, I wrote a paper called Explaining and Harnessing Adversarial Examples in 2014, where I suggested that we should measure the error rate of a classifier on adversarial examples that were created within a norm ball of clean examples. The basic idea of what I was going for there is to study the performance of machine learning models and IID data we need some way of, of, of non-IID data, we need some way of labeling points that do not occur in the data set. Because they're not in the data set, they don't already have a label that we can just look up. So one way that I thought it would be easy and convenient to label these points is to propagate the labels from nearby points that are already in the, in the data set. So we basically say, we're going to benchmark on as large a subset of the input domain as we can. Uh, we're going to say that any point that is near a test example we can copy the label over from that test example. We use a norm to say which things are near enough. This is nice because it's easy to specify mathematically. It's easy to implement in software and automate benchmark tests. But it's not really a good model of what attackers will do in the real world. I think of this as kind of the drosophila of adversarial machine learning. It's something that's easy to run in the lab, but isn't necessarily showing us uh, what we should be doing in current applied security scenarios. Another important part of specifying the game is determining who goes first, whether the attacker goes first or the defender goes first. If the attacker goes first, it's actually pretty easy to defend. For most kind of attacks you can think of, the defender just trains on the attacks, and then they're able to resist them uh, at test time. You can see this with CAPTCHAs. In 2013, we just trained a neural net on a lot of CAPTCHAs, and it learned to read CAPTCHAs. The perturbations and randomizations made by the attacker don't fool the model when it's trained on them. What's a lot harder is when the defender goes first. 
the defender commits to a model that they're going to use, and then the attacker gets to think about how they're going to break that model. That's the version that we usually study in the adversarial example literature. And that's very hard because the attacker gets to react to whatever the defender does. It's the main reason that the adversarial example problem is not solved yet. A lot of adversarial example papers that you see today study only the situation where the attacker goes first. And then they introduce some defense mechanism that circumvents the specific attack that they studied. That's usually not very interesting because the situation where the attacker goes first is relatively straightforward to solve just by training on the attacks. Um, so when you're looking at papers that do that, you should recognize that they really ought to be benchmarking on an adaptive or a reactive attack where the defender has to go first. When we look at the performance of a defense for adversarial examples, it's important to think clearly about what our goals are for the new model. A lot of the time we see models that increase the error rate on the clean test set at the same time that they decrease the error rate on the adversarial test set. So how should we think about navigating this trade-off? Well, first off, the trade-off is not necessarily fundamental. There are actually cases where adversarially trained models perform better on the clean test set than, uh, the, than the original undefended model did. But in most of the recent literature, we've seen that if you try to give strong robustness to adversarial examples, you usually lose a little bit of accuracy on the test set. The way that I think we should think about this is to consider the composition of the actual test set that the model will encounter when we deploy it. Usually in the machine learning literature, when we talk about the test set, we're referring to clean IID data that comes from the same distribution as the training set. That's probably not what the model is actually going to encounter when it's deployed. Uh, so the way that you should actually evaluate your model depends on what you think it will see at deployment time. A lot of the time in the adversarial example literature, we benchmark on the error rate on adversarial examples. That's the metric that you would care about if you expect your model to encounter an adversary on every single input that it encounters at deployment time. That's probably not realistic. Instead, there will be an adversary present some portion of the time. So one thing you might want to do is make a curve like I show here, where on the x-axis, you gradually increase the proportion of inputs that are adversarial examples rather than clean IID examples. On the y-axis, you plot the accuracy of different models that you're considering. So here, I plot the accuracy of three different models, uh, top five accuracy on the ImageNet data set. The green curve is an undefended baseline model, just an Inception v3 network. And then I consider two different defenses against adversarial examples. Uh, one of them is the adversarial logit pairing model that we introduced recently. It's currently state-of-the-art on ImageNet. The other one is um, the mixed PGD defense. That it's just another one of the baselines we included in our paper. When we look at this trade-off curve, we see that on the very left, the baseline is better because on the clean data, it has the best accuracy. On the right, adversarial logit pairing is the best because it has the highest accuracy on adversarial examples. Now let's consider the alternative defense, um, MPGD. We see that MPGD is slightly better on the clean data and worse on the adversarial data. From that, we might think that MPGD navigates a trade-off between clean performance and adversarial performance. But actually, by making this plot, we see that MPGD is not on the top of the trade-off curve at any point going across the, the, whole, um, the whole sweep of proportion of examples that are adversarial. So from this, we can see that actually MPGD is not visiting a useful point in the trade-off space. We can also see what kind of test set we would need to expect to have before we prefer to use the defense rather than to use the undefended baseline. Specifically, we can see where the green curve intersects with the orange curve. So that's where about 7.1% of the examples are adversarial examples. If fewer than this number of examples are adversarial examples, then we actually prefer to use the undefended baseline because there just isn't enough of an adversarial situation to justify this defense that reduces the test error, the, the test accuracy. To make the defense more widely usable, we can do two different things. We can either improve the accuracy on adversarial examples so that we gain more by trading off um, clean accuracy, or we can increase its accuracy on the clean data so that there isn't as much of a trade-off to be made in the first place. A lot of defenses are based on a principle called gradient masking. Uh, the idea of gradient masking is basically all of these attack algorithms that we study are based on gradient-based optimizers that search for inputs that fool the model. So what if we could break the optimizer by hiding the gradient, by turning it into a zero, or by making the gradient point in random or useless directions? 
In general, this is called gradient masking because these defenses break the optimizer, but they don't actually make the model more robust. If there was an input point that was misclassified before, it is often still misclassified by a defense that uses this approach. Sometimes you see defenses that intentionally use gradient masking. Uh, for example, they might um, take hidden units in the network and round them to zero or one rather than using a continuous value. And then because the hidden units are step functions, the gradient through the network is zero. Uh, that's one example of intentional gradient masking. A lot of the time we actually have unintentional gradient masking. For example, we find that if we train on lots of adversarial examples, sometimes we get models that are resistant to the attack that we trained on, but their decision boundary hasn't moved very much. All that we learned was how to break the optimizer that we trained against during the training process. When we define the norm ball games, we usually use the max norm in pixel space. And that's one thing that's been a little bit confusing to some people. I want to explain really clearly why we're using the max norm. Um, the main important thing is that we really shouldn't use the L2 norm. And I'm illustrating that with some MNIST examples here. So in each row, I show you a pair of MNIST examples, and then I show you the vector of the differences between them. In the first row, I show you the two MNIST examples that I find that are the nearest to each other if I search over all the MNIST classes except ones. I left ones out of this because a lot of ones look like sevens, and so the nearest neighbors just, it looks like a pair of sevens. Um, so the nearest two MNIST digits in terms of L0 distance are this three and this seven in the top row. And if we look at the L2 distance between them, that's about 4.8. Uh, and then if we look at the difference um, between the next pair of examples that are the nearest in terms of L1 norm, the distance there is even smaller. It's about 3.2 in L2 distance. If we actually optimize the L2 distance directly, in the third row, we find this four and this nine that are near each other. The L2 distance between them is only 2.8. And then if we look for the nearest examples in terms of L infinity distance, the distance between them is about 3.8. Well, what, if, what happens if we just take random noise and then clip it to the, um, the, the range of the features, the black and the white pixel values that we're allowed to display here? It turns out that just adding random noise to a clean digit will get us a perturbation size of about 4.8, which is uh, bigger than three of these class changing perturbations that I showed you above. So in the table, I highlight anything that's bigger than the random perturbation in red, anything that's smaller than the random perturbation in green. We see that for this random uniform perturbation, the max norm actually thinks that, um, thinks that all of the perturbations that change the class are, are bigger than the perturbation that didn't change the class. But all of the other norms make mistakes, and they think that class changing perturbations were smaller than the random perturbation we should ignore. The main thing you can take away from this is that the L2 norm is a bad idea because it lets you concentrate all of your edits on a few pixels. You can completely erase white pixels or completely draw in new white pixels uh, by concentrating the L2 norm perturbation on those particular locations. Um, the L0 and L1 norm, they're relatively okay. They don't fare very well in this example where the reference random perturbation I use is uniform. You can construct other random perturbations like adding random background pixels that would make max norm look bad and make L0 and L1 look good. But basically L2 usually looks bad under almost any, any reasonable random perturbation you can consider. So by constraining the attacks using the max norm, we're able to make the attack perturbations pretty big in terms of L2 norm and still preserve the class. All right, so we've mostly talked about this fake game that we study for basic research purposes where it's really easy to specify, really easy to automatically benchmark. The problem is this doesn't actually apply to attacks in the real world. Uh, things like the stop sign that I showed you earlier with graffiti on the stop sign, uh, that's not very easily characterized with a simple norm ball. I guess you might be able to characterize it with, with an L0 norm, but an L0 norm big enough to allow this would allow a lot of other things that would change the class. Um, also the picture of the apple in the mesh bag, that's really not characterizable by a uh, norm distance from any particular example very easily. All of these different effects together make it really difficult to uh, develop a useful defense against adversarial examples. And I found that when I work on adversarial example defense projects, there's sort of a sequence of different failure modes that they might encounter. And you know, better ideas make it through more steps of this pipeline before they fail. I think to get used to this idea of a pipeline of possible failures, a lot of you are probably used to writing computer code. So a lot of the time you start off by writing a bunch of code and then you try to compile it. 
And at first, it just doesn't even compile. You've got syntax errors or something. Then you fix the syntax errors, and you start to run it, and the tests don't pass. And then you get to the point where your tests pass, but you encounter problems when you run it live and so on. This is more or less the same process where as defenses get better, they fail at later steps in the pipeline. So th the worst thing that can happen with a defense idea is that it just doesn't actually do anything about the adversarial examples. A lot of ideas fall apart at that stage of the pipeline. But next, you can actually succeed at reducing the error rate on adversarial examples, and it turns out that you hurt the clean accuracy so much that the trade-off is not worth it. Um, if you successfully get through both those stages, you bring down the error rate on adversarial examples, you preserve the low error rate on clean examples. The next stage of problems that usually comes up is that the defense may not deal with an adaptive attacker. You are able to bring down the error rate on adversarial examples that you had just sitting on disk, but if the adversary makes new ones based on your new model, you can't do anything about those. If you get to the stage where you can handle an adaptive attacker, it often turns out that your defense is overfit to a really specific attack algorithm. Um, maybe you're really good at resisting uh, gradient ascent on the probability of the target class. But it turns out that if people add noise before they run gradient ascent, they can break your model. Finally, you might actually be able to get really good performance for a lot of different attack algorithms that all fall within your threat model. In this case, a lot of the time we then find out that the good performance was an illusion, that there was something wrong with our benchmarking process. For example, that we used gradient masking to break all these optimization algorithms. And when someone comes up with a new attack algorithm, we find out that we actually have not provided security within the specified threat model. Finally, and the point where the state of the art models are today, we can actually generalize across many different attack algorithms, but we provide security only within a single limited threat model, and we don't generalize outside of that particular threat model at all. So for example, we have models that are very good at resisting adversarial perturbations within a norm ball, but they're not very good at resisting arbitrary attacks. I'll walk through and give an example of each of these failures now. Uh, so one of the first failed defenses that uh, my group at Google saw when we were working on this problem is using dropout. When we first thought of adversarial examples, we thought it was really just an overfitting problem and we had to regularize them out. Uh, every neural net person's favorite regularizer is dropout. But actually, a lot of the models that we were testing already were trained with dropout to begin with. So we found that training with dropout doesn't really do much to help with adversarial examples. Um, next, we thought, well, this is, we were still thinking about this from the point of view of a regularization issue. Weight decay is another really good regularizer. Uh, so in the first paper that we wrote on adversarial examples, we tried uh, squared L2 weight decay. And we found that if you turn up the coefficient on the weight decay a lot, you can eventually reduce the error rate on adversarial examples. But you also increase the error rate on clean examples a lot. Uh, for linear models, you can actually show it analytically that you have to reduce the slope of the linear model so much that you can't fit the clean data anymore. I, I, that claim is problem, problem dependent. It depends on the margin in your data set. But for MNIST, you can show that. Uh, a while later, I, I did some analysis and I decided that L1 weight decay might be better than L2 weight decay, but the same thing happened there. If you make the coefficient big enough to have an effect on the adversarial examples, you lose a lot of clean accuracy. Uh, another stage in the pipeline is when you start to see an effect on adversarial examples, you preserve your accuracy on the clean examples, uh, but you, um, you don't actually generalize to an adaptive attacker. An example of this is using cropping or fovea mechanisms. When adversarial examples were first published, a lot of people reacted by saying, the human brain doesn't actually process a single static image. Your eyes glance around the scene constantly, and maybe these multiple glimpses from different translated positions can actually help you to recognize the image correctly. And that's been refuted several times, uh, most recently, I think, by Nicholas, who presented earlier this morning. Uh, essentially, if you design an attack algorithm that knows you're going to uh, use the fovea or the cropping mechanism, you can defeat it pretty easily. Uh, another stage of the pipeline is when you're actually able to beat one specific attack algorithm, but you can't beat other attack algorithms that come within the same threat model. The first time we got a defense of this capability was in 2014. I, I found that if you train on a lot of adversarial examples and you continuously generate them in the inner loop of the training algorithm so that you're really solving a minimax problem, you can actually learn to beat the attack algorithm that you're playing against. For that, I was using a very weak attack algorithm called the fast gradient sign method, uh, 
It calculates the adversarial example using just one step of optimization, using a heuristic that makes it have a high success rate, but it's still only one step of optimization. It makes it cheap enough that it's easy to run in the inner loop of training, but it's still a very weak attack. So with that approach, we were able to beat this single step attack procedure, but we weren't able to beat multi-step attack procedures. Um, it's also pretty common to have defenses that look like they've done really well in a lot of different threat models, but then later get broken when someone thinks of a, a new attack. One example of this is defensive distillation. It's a model that performed very well under a lot of different benchmarks, but later uh, Nicholas Carlini was able to break it uh, with, with a more powerful optimization approach. And this happens all the time. Another recent example was one of my own papers on using thermometer codes uh, to improve the robustness of a model. Turned out not to offer any advantage. Uh, also broken just when people tried new attack algorithms on it. Uh, finally, and this is really the state of the art today, you might have a defense that generalizes very well across a lot of different attack models, and you may be very confident that it's hard to design a new attack that breaks it. It might have survived a lot of contests. It might come with a proof that you can't break it under the specified threat model. Well, all of the algorithms that we have today that meet these properties, they don't generalize beyond one really specific threat model. Uh, so for example, if you use multi-step adversarial training, adding noise before you create the adversarial examples, that is able to uh, resist any attack we know of within the max norm ball that it was trained with. But if you switch to a different norm, such as an L1 norm constraining the attack, it's very easy to beat. And clearly other stranger attacks uh, can easily beat it as well. The same thing applies to all of the certified defenses that exist today. All of the uh, proof certificates are based on examining the geometry of the neural net and saying that it outputs the same uh, class for every point near a specific test input. Because it's based on this geometric idea of nearness according to a specific norm, you can break the certificate uh, by switching to a different attack model that isn't based on norm-constrained attacks. In terms of the state of the art on norm-based attacks on ImageNet today, the state of the art is an algorithm called adversarial logit pairing. The idea is you train your model on a lot of adversarial examples, and besides training it to classify the adversarial examples, you also regularize the model to have similar logits on both the clean examples and the adversarial examples. Um, the intuition behind this is that you're telling the model that each specific adversarial example is similar to the specific clean example that was used to create it. Instead of saying you should do very well on the whole population of adversarial examples, you're additionally saying you should recognize that this adversarial cat is the same as the specific clean cat that generated it. On a more theoretical side, you can actually see adversarial logit pairing as a way of generalizing weight decay from shallow models to deep models. But that's, that's a little bit more abstract. Overall, this was the first defense to achieve greater than 50% top five accuracy against iterative adversarial examples on ImageNet, which is why it's the current state of the art. But as far as we know, this would not actually generalize out of the max norm ball. Uh, just to explain where adversarial logit pairing came from, uh, it, the first defenses that have been described for machine learning models were mostly for convex models uh, in the time before I actually got involved working on this problem. From when I started working on this, I'm, I'm a neural net person, so I started working on it when we started thinking about this problem for neural nets. Uh, in 2013, we had the idea of training on adversarial examples, but we just generated a bunch of them once and then added them to the training set. That didn't work very well. In 2014, I figured out a much cheaper way of making them fast so that we could actually generate them constantly in the inner loop of the optimization algorithm. And that made it so we could beat the specific attack that we trained on, but we couldn't beat other attacks. Uh, in 2016, we tried training on stronger attacks without a lot of success. Eventually, in 2017, uh, Alex Madry's lab upgraded the strength of the attack to the point that adversarial training actually generalized over multiple attacks and is able to get good robustness within a specific threat model. And in this year, with the logit pairing technique, we've increased the robustness uh, beyond what was previously possible with adversarial training, but still within the same threat model. Um, Looking back on, I guess, this five years of progress on working on this toy game, I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed. I feel like it's fair for me to say that because I was one of the first people who set up this toy game. Um, 
my hope when I started advocating this problem was that something really simple would solve the adversarial example problem. Uh, like for example, using Bayesian deep nets. Maybe that suddenly makes the deep nets resistant to adversarial examples. And that this really simple method would perform really well on the norm ball benchmark. Um, and that it would also do well on other benchmarks that weren't designed from that same point of view. I thought of the norm balls as an easy way to propagate labels to points that weren't included in the test set, but I didn't think of them as the main thing we'd be trying to defend against. What's happened instead is that the best defenses under this metric are mostly based on directly optimizing the metric itself. Uh, these adversarial training approaches, they essentially uh, directly train the model to do well on specifically the adversarial examples we're going to benchmark on. And the result is that the defenses don't generalize beyond this one particular threat model. So for future directions in adversarial example research, what I hope all of you will start working on, uh, one thing I think is really important is to work on what I call indirect methods. Uh, if we think of adversarial training as a direct method where we write down the performance under a particular threat model and just optimize it directly, that's setting us up to fail to generalize out of one particular threat model. Instead, I think we should think about what are the flaws in machine learning algorithms that lead to them performing badly in this threat model in the first place and try to address those flaws. What are some methods that aren't specifically designed to address the norm ball problem that still perform well in that benchmark? Some of the best methods that we have so far are uh, logit pairing, where for two different inputs, you regularize the logits to be similar. Uh, in the paper on adversarial logit pairing, we actually found that non-adversarial logit pairing also reduces the error rate on adversarial examples. If you, for example, um, pair the logits of, of uh, two different clean examples, that can actually reduce your adversarial error rate. Another technique called label smoothing is where we train the model to output probabilities less than one. Most of the time with maximum likelihood training, we just continuously maximize the probability of the correct class and we never tell the model to stop boosting its confidence, even if it gets to the point where it thinks there's less than a one in 10 million chance that the example was labeled wrong. Label smoothing is where you say, well, instead of shooting for probability one, why don't you shoot for probability 0.9? And if you start to be more confident than that, maybe don't work on boosting your confidence on this particular example now. That seems to result in models that perform better on adversarial examples. Um, another technique called logit squeezing is where you just regularize the logits to be small. Similar to label smoothing, you're asking the model to be less confident and to not extrapolate quite as wildly. But these are all relatively weak defenses. They're examples of things that are indirect and don't have the threat model baked into them, but they don't perform nearly as well as adversarial training yet. What I'm hoping people can do is think about what kind of indirect methods might lead to, improv to improvements on the test set and then implement those methods and benchmark them on this adversarial test set and see if they result in a strong, perf a strong improvement. Another really important direction for future research is that we should develop better attack models and better benchmarking systems. Uh, it's, it's easy to point out that the norm ball is not a very useful benchmark for real world applications, but it's hard to actually build a good benchmark that everybody can use and compete on. If somebody introduces a new better benchmark for this community to work on, that would be a huge accomplishment that would make the, the usefulness of everybody's research increase a lot. Um, so we really ought to study threat models other than the norm ball model. We ought to study messy real world problems in addition to clean toy problems. I don't think we should abandon clean toy problems entirely. Uh, clean toy problems are nice because you can analyze them theoretically. You can uh, control a lot of aspects of them to really break down a system into its components and understand how each one works but we really ought to study something more than only these problems. Um, certification methods are good. They've been kind of underexplored. The ones that we have so far are all based on geometrical properties of saying that examples near a particular reference example should be classified the same as the reference example. I think we should really explore certification methods more and use principles other than local constancy to provide these, these proof certificates. And finally, I agree with Nicholas's recommendation this morning. He was saying he studied uh, speech because it's not vision, and all the adversarial example research so far is on vision. I think we really should study problems other than vision, and I'd actually go a little bit further than what Nicholas did. Um, 
one thing that's really weird about vision is that you can easily make inputs where it's not clear what the right output should be. You can go off the manifold and get just garbage data where you know, two humans may not even agree on what the output should be. I think it could actually be worth studying problems that have an easily computed ground truth answer. Like just study machine learning models that look at a number and say whether it's prime or not. Or RNNs that answer simple arithmetic questions. Those applications are easy to solve without machine learning, but studying them could tell us something about how adversarial machine learning works. And studying these domains other than vision would avoid a lot of the strange problems about how do we measure the true similarity of two inputs in vision? Or what's the correct answer for an off-manifold input in vision? Um, I also think that we've uncovered, uh, uncovered a lot of different goals that are completely independent from supervised learning that we should measure when we work on uh, machine learning security. Until recently, I had really thought of machine learning security as being completely aligned with basic research and supervised learning. We both just want to make the model better. We want to make the model more accurate. We want to make it generalized better. I actually think we're starting to see some areas where security has completely independent concerns from traditional supervised learning. If you imagine that you have two different models that both have the same error volume um, so that they'd both be tied from the point of view of traditional supervised learning performance. We can now see a lot of properties that we would prefer one model to have over the other for the point of view of security. One of these is we would like the model to have lower confidence when it makes mistakes so that we can shut down rather than report an erroneous prediction. Uh, we'd also like to make a model whose mistakes are harder to find if, if you have a gradient that leads you straight to the mistakes so that an attacker can find it over and over and over again, that's really bad for security. But you can imagine if your errors don't have any clues pointing to where they are, then the attacker has to fall back to random search to find them. Uh, if you could develop stochastic models that have the same error rate as some given deterministic model, but their errors occur in different locations, or the erroneous class that they output changes class ID, each time you run the model, then it's harder for the adversary to control the model and get the output they want. If you're trying to break into a secure facility and you have a mask you can wear where you know that it's always gonna make the model make a mistake, but you don't know who it's going to think you are, uh, that's a lot less useful for the attacker than if you can always say that you're going to be specifically some person who has access to the facility. Uh, it also makes a lot of sense to think about the value or the cost that comes from specific mistakes. Uh, if you can make a car ignore a stop sign, um, that's probably worse than if you can make a car hallucinate a stop sign. Uh, if, if you come to a gentle stop at an intersection where you didn't have to stop, that doesn't cause a problem. If you run a stop sign, that causes a problem. Um, making models that are harder to reverse engineer by sending inputs to them and observing their outputs can make it harder for the attacker to mount uh, model theft attacks and black box attacks. Also, making models where it's less likely that adversarial examples will transfer from one model to another can provide more security in black box threat models. So all of these things are different from traditional supervised learning, and they're things that I think will really differentiate the security literature from the supervised learning literature. A lot of the time when you write papers, it's not really clear who we're writing to. You read a paper and it isn't really clear if it's meant to be an improvement to supervised learning or if it's meant to be an improvement to security, and if it's an improvement to security, what is the specific threat model? I think if we're really clear about which metric we're going for and motivating it with a specific threat model, it will improve the quality of all the papers we write and make the literature easier to follow. I've also focused a lot on security reasons to study adversarial examples. There are actually some non-security reasons to study them that are probably of less interest to this audience, but worth keeping in mind. Uh, one is that by studying the bugs in machine learning, we can learn more about the bugs in the human brain and from that, we can learn something about how the human brain works. Uh, my colleagues and I have shown that we can actually make adversarial examples for humans. Uh, this picture here of a, a cat with the German Shepherd next to it, that's an adversarial uh, German Shepherd that uh, we think is probably fooling you into thinking it's a German Shepherd when it's actually still a cat. Um, it's hard to tell whether, when you're attacking a, a human with no time limit, it's hard to tell whether you're fooling them or whether you've actually changed the true class of the input. If you read our paper, we also showed that we can make inputs where a human who has a time limit and could see the image only very briefly disagrees with a human who has no time limit. And there we can be very confident that we fooled them. We also can use adversarial examples to just improve traditional machine learning, especially in the case of semi-supervised learning where you have a lot of labeled data, or sorry, where you have a lot of unlabeled data and very little labeled data. Uh, one of the state-of-the-art methods is called virtual adversarial training, 
you train the model so that when you make an adversarial perturbation of an unlabeled example, it still keeps the same class output. So you teach it to ignore the nuisance variables that the adversary introduces. This is state of the art on a lot of semi-supervised learning tasks. Um, a lot of people who work on adversarial examples see an analogy to the story of a horse named Clever Hans. Uh, we, we got this from an article called Clever Hans, Clever Algorithms by Bob Sturm. He was actually talking about another context in machine learning, but it applies really well to adversarial examples as well. Clever Hans was a horse who was trained to do arithmetic. Uh, you could ask him a question like, Clever Hans, what's two plus one? And then he would tap his hoof. And then everyone would start clapping as soon as he was done tapping. And everybody thought that he could do arithmetic. Um, it turned out later, surprise, surprise, the horse did not actually know how to do math. But the important thing is that no one had actually been trying to commit fraud here. Uh, his owner was actually just training him to do arithmetic by rewarding him when he got the answers right. Uh, the horse was presumably not trying to fool anybody. Uh, you know, the, the audience was a genuine audience, they weren't plants. Uh, what happened was a psychologist came and examined Clever Hans and found that if you remove the audience and if you wear a mask when you ask him the question, he can no longer read your face and figure out when you're excited that he got the right answer. So he'll just keep tapping indefinitely, waiting for some sign of excitement that he's gotten the right answer. So I think Clever Hans is a great metaphor for what's happened with machine learning algorithms. Uh, we set up an IID data set, and we tell them to minimize a cost on this IID data. And they've found a function that works really, really well on the IID data. But then once you change the domain that you test them in, you reveal all of the flaws that, that work perfectly well in the situation where you train them. Um, hopefully, by recognizing this and focusing our research efforts on it, we'll figure out how to make machine learning algorithms that really do understand what they're doing, instead of faking it like Clever Hans. And that will make machine learning better, and it will make machine learning more secure. If you'd like to get involved, uh, we've named our open source library Clever Hans in honor of this story. And you can send a pull request at this URL. Um, I am available for questions. OK, questions. Hi, Jan. This is Rajur Shikupta from Avast. And thank you for an excellent keynote. I mean, it's very easy to present your work. It's much harder to present a really nice summary and a, and a thing about back, back, present, and future. So thank you for that. Um, I want to particularly talk about the thing you mentioned and which Nick also mentioned this morning, that everybody's been working on, on, on images, and it would be nice to work on something else. So I want to point out the area. We are in a security conference. The one place where we have true real life adversary is in the security space where there is malware and there are all malware authors spending lots of money trying to beat us. And I really think that the community in the GAN community, the AI community would do much more by focusing on that effort as a whole. Yeah, so the thing that's really hard is to get um, PhD students or new researchers in a company to choose to work on something hard. Uh, everybody these days has a lot of academic freedom and you can, you can, you know, some new grad research scientist shows up at Google and I say, you know, you're really excited about adversarial examples, you should go study malware classification. And then he goes and talks to the malware team and they say like, oh, well, you need to set up this, this, and this before you can really start benchmarking your idea. And then, then they say, okay, forget it, I'm gonna go work on MNIST. Uh, <laughs> so if, if somebody puts out a really clean benchmark for academics to fight over and make a leaderboard out of, that would change everything really fast. And if you don't change it just by putting out the benchmark, what you do is you write the first paper that's state of the art on the current vision-based benchmarks, and you also include results on malware. And then once you've done that, whoever wants to write the new paper claiming to be state of the art beating you has to beat you <laughs> on both those benchmarks. Um, so benchmarks never die because of the way that reviewing works. You, you always, when you say that your new paper is state of the art, you've got to convince the reviewers you beat all the benchmarks in the old state of the art even if the old state of the art was a really bad benchmark. We, this is a problem we have over in Ganland. Um, we're trying to get people to quit using inception score and move over to a better metric called Frechet inception distance. But everybody keeps using inception score in order to compare with the old papers. So if you can get um, malware detection to be one of these benchmarks that never dies, like inception score, it will really transform what everyone works on. Hi. Um, 
I wanted to ask, you said uh, using uh, data sources that there is hard to manipulate. Um, graphs are typically, when they are very big, are not easy for, like, you know, for example, the DNS graph is something very difficult for a, a user to manipulate. And also, what about categorical variables? Like, imagine a, a credit score problem when it takes my social security as input, it goes and looks up 50 different other databases. Uh, is that a good direction to think, you know? Yeah, so things like credit score are much more advantageous to the defender than things like object recognition because it's hard for an end consumer to directly control the variables that, you know, that Equifax or whoever uses to prepare your credit score. Um, the thing about vision that's really, really hard is that the attacker has relatively few constraints on what they can do in the real world. Like if you have a robot and you want it to go into a room and the attacker can put any kind of object in that room, uh, you know, that object can really show up in any of the pixels and so on. Uh, it's a lot harder for somebody to end up with fake bank accounts on their report that the credit rating agency sees. The question about discrete variables, um, discrete variables are studied less because there are fewer domains where it's easy to say how two discrete inputs are similar to each other. Um, like for text, it's hard to make an imperceptible change to a sentence because almost any change you make is immediately perceptible unless it's like substituting a Unicode character for something that looks similar. Um, one thing that we did recently was we tried to actually solve adversarial examples for vision by converting from real valued inputs to uh, 256 discrete input values for each pixel. And at first we thought that worked really well. Later it turned out that a new attack algorithm designed to optimize against discrete variables uh, brought us down to uh, much lower accuracy. Uh, since then we've improved our defenses on the discrete variables and it turns out we're about the same as if we just used real variables. So it, at the moment it looks like real versus discrete doesn't make much of a difference as long as you have a really strong attack algorithm for both domains. Okay, we have another question. Hi, uh, you said uh, the way adversarial example works is because uh, the adversarial examples, they are not from the same distribution and the, they are not IID. But uh, I mean, did you uh, do experiments or to characterize the real underlying distribution of these images so that you can conclude the adversarial examples, they are really not from the same distribution. Well, you can just look at them. Um, the ones we use in most papers, the images are clearly very noisy looking compared to the data that's in the real distribution. Um, you can also do things like you can think about what's the probability that an example constructed by an attack would occur randomly. Um, so say that you have something like fast gradient sign method where it increases a pixel if increasing that pixel will hurt the defender. It decreases a pixel if uh, decreasing that pixel will hurt the defender. So you can imagine what if, what if we had real data that was a bit noisy where you added random perturbations. And from that you can see the chance of the random perturbations going in the same direction as the adversarial perturbations is two to the number of, it is one over two to the number of pixels. So it's, it's like, for most of the tasks we're talking about it, it it's like, you know, Less, less of a chance than picking a single atom out of all the atoms in the universe. Uh, so they're, they're, really, they're really, really unlikely, basically. Um, yeah, uh, I'm uh, from Penn State. Um, so I've been working in this field for one or two years already. Uh, it seems like uh, the reason like deep neural network can work really, really good because it takes high dimensional data. Uh, given that, which also I feel uh, this mean, also means like the adversarial sample space is exponent, exponentially large. Um, so as a security researcher, we usually are looking for the solution which can completely resolve the problem. So given your expertise, so how do you feel what the destination of this area uh, in terms of defending against the adversarial samples? Yeah, the, the destination is actually kind of hard to see. I think at some point we might start to get you know proofs about fundamental limits on what we, what we can actually hope to accomplish. There is some theoretical work like that, but it's, it's in theoretical models that are not very representative of real tasks so far. Um, it might turn out that the best we can really hope for is to make it really annoying for the attacker. Uh, like, like sometimes security is based just on 
making the cost of the attack higher than the value of the successful attack. And that might be all the more that we can hope to do. You're right that the input space is huge. I think that's a lot of why adversarial examples are really hard. For traditional machine learning, you know, you might have uh, n input variables. And for something like ImageNet classification, n is around 65,000. Um, if you think of each variable as having 255 different values, then you're talking about uh, 255 to the 65,000 uh, <laughs> different possible inputs. And that's a huge number. For traditional computer vision, we all need to process naturally occurring inputs. And those lie on a very thin manifold. I mean, maybe, I guess we don't really have a good characterization of that manifold, but it, it seems like it's not entirely impossible to imagine that the manifold might even have basically measure zero it, it, out of the space of Rn. And now for security, we need to defend on all of Rn. That seems really, really hard. Um, I think one approach to eventually solving it could be making models that have really good default behavior. If you look at models like Gaussian processes, when you go far from the training data, they fall back to having very low confidence predictions, uh, where the variance of the Gaussian process gets really high. Neural nets, when you go outside of the data distribution, they often become extremely confident, especially if you move in a direction chosen by the adversary. That's one of the things that I showed in the explaining and harnessing paper in 2014, is if you pick an adversarial direction and move really far out in Rn, the model of confidence just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So if we could change to models that have really good defaults, more like Gaussian processes do, I think that that might solve a really big chunk of Rn automatically, and then we only need to deal with the points that are near the training data, and that seems more tractable to me. But so far, most attempts at making neural nets fall back to reasonable defaults have not worked very well. All right, uh, we are out of time, so thanks so much again for the great talk.